So I just picked this thing up. Oh, geez, bang me out a month, month and a half ago. So yeah, as you can see, uh, Honda 919, 2002, first year. Came with the accessory uh, thingy. Uh, they call it a sport shield, I guess. It's really nice. Uh, you know, it's pretty good on the highway. Not too bad on the wind blast and all that. The only issue I have with this bike, uh, in stock form, 20 years old, uh, I had a noise in the back. Sounded like something was loose. I went through the tail section. I got everything buttoned up that wasn't, you know, like the uh, the fuel injection boxes back there. Uh, that was kind of loose and seemed like that might be floating around a bit. So I got that stuffed and packed in with some some nice foam. And that's uh, but it still had like a loose sound uh, in the back. And when I come to find out. You know, it's the first time I've ever experienced it on uh, a shock like, well, like really at all. You know, I got the, you know, the KX is over here, similar rear suspension, a little more advanced, but I was experiencing cavitation in that rear shock. And what that feels like in this thing is you hit a small little itty bitty, like a, like a crack in the road or something. And it would feel like something in the back of the bike was loose or the rear suspension was topping out. And when I say topping out, what that means is uh, it's as if it's traveling upward without damping and hitting a hard stop like the top of its stroke. Uh, it didn't seem like it was doing that. It's, you know, it's, it sits pretty far down in the stroke when it's loaded, you know, but it felt like something was loose in the back end of this bike. So I ordered a shock. I got this spare shock on eBay and I start screwing around with it a little bit. And, uh, you know, I was kind of amazed. There's not much information on these things. So that's kind of why I bought another one before I started fucking with it. But uh, this is what you get inside of this shock. This is just the first step of disassembly, but this is as far as I went for now, just to see what we're working with. There's your uh, reservoir. Uh, there's your bladder inside of it. It's a little unusual in that the bladder is basically uh, reversed from the way you usually find it. It's something like that. This bladder here, uh, the oil is inside, and the air pressure, you know, when this is all assembled, the bladder's inside of the uh, reservoir. The air pressure goes around the outside of the bladder. Reservoir was a real puzzle. This one, it's, it's weird. Uh, so, this is the end cap here. You have an O-ring for a, you know to seal the pressure in. There's no Schrader valve. There's no provisions or means to recharge this thing. Those things, you can't quite see it, but if you look underneath that reservoir, under there, there's a little Schrader valve in there. It allows you to recharge the bladder and pressurize the shock after it's been rebuilt to prevent cavitation and ensure consistent damping. This thing here uh, was worse than the one I had on the bike. This one's a little uh, newer. It's got the, uh, the clicker in here for rebound, but uh, worked like absolute shit. Uh, no damping control, except for most of the way out of the stroke. You know, you could feel it hit the damping. So obviously it's got some air in that shock, you know, and as old as these things are, uh, it's to be expected. But, uh, so anyway, this is one I took apart. Uh, in the process of taking it apart, this is a cap that came out of this shock. This cap, I haven't modified. The one on the bike, of course, I've already done. Had to do something here. Of course, you get on the internet and everybody says, oh, that stock shock is a piece of shit. Just throw it away, get yourself an Olin's, uh, get a CBR 600 F3 shock or whatever. And those aren't quite right, but I guess they work. And I didn't want to do any of that. It didn't seem like a really a great option. You know, stock shock, uh, We'll see how it works with pressure in it, right? So what I did is I popped that cap out. And I drilled it and I installed, and it's a little longer, it's a little comical, that full-size tire valve stem sticking out of it, but this is more of a proof of concept type of thing. We'll see if it worked and I can tell you it worked great. You know, the shock all of a sudden does what it's supposed to do. So yeah, that's what I did with this one. I didn't touch the valving. I didn't even drain the oil out of this one. I didn't open that shock in any way. This one I opened because, you know, the, the job was already done and I could I can experiment with this one and screw around with it a little bit. But yeah, the uh, the oil in this one with uh, unknown miles, I'm guessing around 14, 15K, the oil looked clean. So as far as doing an oil change, it's, I don't think it's really necessary on these things. It wouldn't hurt, but uh, they're designed to last a long time without service. They're not designed to be serviced at all. Again, looking at this, ridiculous. Uh, it's simply a cap. There's no. I'm not sure how they pressurize these to begin with. When they build them, they must pressurize them somehow. But I can't, for the life of me, figure out how to do that simply or easily, you know, um, without having a Schrader valve. So that's what I did with this one. You know, you just uh, pop that cap out of there, uh, center punch it, drill it, 
Uh, I used again just for this is more of an experimental deal. You know, it turns out it works great, so maybe I'll you know do something a little more official. But for now, I just used the Honda Bond, which is a semi drying gasket sealer type of thing, uh, soft, uh, sticky, and get it filling in, flowing to where it needs to flow. Uh, the Honda Bond is around the uh, the valve stem where it goes through, and then on the top of the Honda Bond, once that had set up, I put in a nice coat of JB Weld as well to uh, further reinforce and uh, seal and solidify the whole thing. And it's working great. This thing's holding. Just checked it now. I uh, got over 100 PSI in it with this uh, bike pump somehow. And I just pumped it up another 30 with my hand pump. And I'll tell you what, that's all you need. Everybody wants to tell you you need nitrogen and all that. I've done them for years. Again, with KX's. You get one of these guys at a bike shop or something. As you can see, it's a Cannondale brand. That little son of a bitch is all you need right there. And it'll go way higher than you ever have any reason to with a shock. So, you know, yeah, just fill them with fucking air. Uh, preferably uh, low humidity. You know, if you live in Louisiana or something, it's going to contain a little more moisture. You might have issues. I don't know. I, mean, I hear a lot of guys doing the same thing elsewhere in the world and in the country. And nobody seems to have an issue using air, which is already about 79% nitrogen. Sure, there's some water vapor and some other shit, a little oxygen, but it's never been a problem for me with the, uh, the big bikes, and those shocks get mighty hot, and they get a hell of a workout, so I think it's, you know, for a street bike especially, you're in the clear. So yeah, once you punch the Schrader valve into this son of a bitch, you can pressurize it. The way that works with the cavitation, what that describes is, in here you have a, uh, you know, it's a single, uh, I don't know what the technical terminology, it's um, like a... Uh, the body of the shock, the, the single tube, I think this is technically like a twin tube shock. You have the actual tube where the piston and, and the valving is, and you have the uh, twin tube here, which is where you have the bladder. Uh, as the shock compresses the shaft, that chrome shaft enters the body and displaces fluid. So the fluid's got to have a place to go, and it goes into the body. This all works great if there's pressure acting on the bladder to equalize the pressure in the shock. Between the, both sides of the piston, you have the rebound chamber, which is, you know, under rebound, it's building pressure, and the compression side of it up here, where it's, you know, moving in the direction it moves during compression. If you don't have any pressure in the bladder, there's an, uh, a tendency, especially in this cheap, cheesy shock, uh, for the piston to, instead of having the oil flow through the valving into the rebound side, it'll simply, the piston will push oil ahead of it out of the shock and into the reservoir. And what that does is, of course, on the rebound side, uh, it's going to pull a vacuum. It's going to empty a, you know, a void in there. It's going to just, you know, the fluid's not going to stretch and fill it. It's just going to, basically, it's going to, it's going to be an empty void where there's no oil. And so what happens is, under the compression stroke, it's going to compress, displace the fluid. It's going to, pressure's going to drop into a vacuum on the rebound side. And what happens is, it compresses, and when it rebounds, it does so with zero damping until it hits whatever oil is on the rebound side. So it's, you're going to get that topping out sensation. You're going to get a, it's going to feel like the back end of the bike is loose. It's going to feel shitty. Now on smooth roads, you'll probably never notice. Uh, out here in uh, good old New Mexico, I have about a quarter mile of garbage pavement and then dirt, which is pretty rough. And then I get to the actual streets, which have about six or eight inch gaps in them. So until I got out to the nice part of the roads, uh, you know, this this bike, you could tell something was not quite right, and it was in the back, and you know, it, again, once I got up to a smoother part of the pavement, it was fine, once you're away from the sharp little square edge chuck holes and stuff, but, you know, you could tell it wasn't right, and uh, the real problem with that is eventually in time, uh, I'll have to pull this apart to confirm my suspicions, but you have a piston, which is on the end of that chrome damper rod, that shaft, the piston's always moving inside of here, but you also have, I'm presuming, a seal head inside of this body. And the seal head should be held in place by the pressure in the reservoir. So the pressure applies pressure to this whole shock body. Relative to the atmosphere on this side of it, that seal head should be held firmly down against what I'm guessing is one of these here lip rings, which these ones came out of the uh, you know, the reservoir body. But the seal head is only retained by pressure inside of the shock. So if you have low pressure, which these things are all, I think the last one of these they made was 07. So the newest, nicest, cleanest, freshest CB919 you're going to find has uh, 15 years on the original charge and there's not going to be a whole lot of pressure left in that shock. So what's going to happen is uh, every time it cavitates like that, pretend this is your seal head, 
uh, which has the shaft going through it, and it's got a seal right here. Every time it cavitates and it pulls a vacuum in the rebound chamber, it's going to tend to suck that seal head up into the body of the shock. And then, of course, when it rebounds and that piston comes back down, it's going to slam the seal head back down against the snap ring. So every time you're hitting a bump, the seal head's moving. The seal head is not designed to move. It's going to uh, most likely wear out that shock body, especially if there's some dirt or some grit or whatever. You know, these things are exposed to everything. Uh, the seal head is not meant to be moving inside of these shocks. So if your pressure in the reservoir is low, not only is it going to cause inconsistent, shitty damping, uh, loose feeling, uh, kind of like a pogo stick. I've seen that phrase used uh, online to describe these 919 shocks. I don't know how many of those guys ever rode them when they were new. You know, the magazines didn't say too much bad about them. They seem to think they work pretty well. Uh, if you're trying to judge this thing with... I mean, as far as when I got this thing apart, uh, there's more pressure in a fresh can of beer than I got out of this reservoir when I drilled the cap. Uh, before I drilled the cap, of course, what I did when it's all assembled, you can, you know, if there's not much pressure in this reservoir, and this is in here right here, you can try, let me see, the, you can push that cap in. So if you can't force the cap in, there's at least some pressure in your shock. This shock here, and the shock that's back on the bike now with a fresh charge of a uh, pressure in that bladder. Both of those shocks in the uh, as received condition with uh, a little bit of force to break that cap free. Once I broke the seal on it basically, once I broke through the uh, the grit, uh, you know, it was stuck in place pretty good. But once I was able to apply enough force, I was able to push both of these uh, caps into the reservoir indicating, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 PSI. Uh, ideally you want to have at least 100 and say 120 I'm guessing. I don't have that. There's not really a spec on these things. They're not really designed to be serviced, as far as I can tell. And these bikes, uh, that KYB 46 millimeter, uh, about 155. Eh, no, probably about 140, 140, 142 uh, on ballpark. Man, you just about 150 in there. I don't want to go too crazy. Uh, I don't jump this bike. Uh, I don't think you need quite as much. Uh, you know, especially considering you know we got a linkage system on that one. This one doesn't see the same shaft speeds, it doesn't see the same energy, really. So I only put about 100, uh, I think 130, 140 in there, which is excessive, probably, but uh, in time it bleeds down, they always do. That's just uh, something we learned from servicing these things. Uh, these dirt bikes really uh, service them at least once a year, and by the time you service those shocks, they're down to 90 or 100 PSI before you know it. So you'd be surprised how quickly that, uh, that reservoir will bleed down. This one here, the reservoir volume, not that much. You know, if you consider the size of that, uh, and once this is all installed, the size of the bladder, there's not a whole lot of volume for, you know, if it's nitrogen or whatever, whatever volume of uh, air you're using, whatever gas you're using, there's just not that much room in this shock for any given volume of charge, you know. So basically what I'm trying to say is uh, when it starts to bleed down, it's going to bleed down pretty quick. If it had a, a much larger volume, like, you know, uh, say three or four times as much, you got a higher volume bladder, a reservoir, if you could hold more pressure it would take longer for that pressure to bleed down to the point where the shock is going to start to, you know, uh, the damping is going to be affected. Uh, once you get into the cavitation though, it's just working like garbage. So anyway, I, I wanted to kind of get this out there. I was really surprised nobody's, to my knowledge, I couldn't find anything, wrist, twist, uh, wrist twisters, uh, there's a lot of CV919 stuff on there, CV9, what do they call these things, CV900F, it's a 919. A lot of information about these shocks and the people bitching about how much they suck, but uh, I couldn't find anybody that's ever taken one of these apart even this far. This is just the first step you know, to do this properly, what I'd like to do. I'm going to have to get a spring compressor, uh, remove the spring, uh, that way you can get in here, this, this, uh, this guy here, that cap on the body, that, I'm guessing, comes out. If it's anything like these KYB or Showa, this is a Showa, but it doesn't matter. Uh, these are it's completely different equipment. But basically, I'm guessing that, that guy's going to come out. There's going to be another little uh, split ring or circlip type of deal inside of the shock body that retains the seal head to access the valving and all that. Uh, you're going to have to get this out, take the circlip out, and uh, that seal head's going to come out. And then the piston with all the valving comes out behind it. I'm guessing it's going to be pretty typical uh, equipment once I get in there. But what I need to do with this one, uh, of course, the bumper is deteriorated on these street shocks. The travel is so short, you can't really see it. Even just sitting on the kickstand, that shock's partially compressed. 
uh, you get into that bumper a hell of a lot. So the bumper, if it's deteriorated, that's going to be an issue, you know. So this one, yeah, it looks like garbage. So I'll have to pull this shock all the way apart at some point. Maybe I'll make another video when I do that. As good as this one on the bike is working, I'm not in a big hurry. You know, I got no shortage of projects here. I got shit to do. This is just the one room. I got another, uh, there's more in there. So, but anyway. So that at least got the bike going. It got the shock working properly again. The oil looked good. I wouldn't worry about, you know, if you want to do a full service, you're going to have to take this apart completely. Uh, that means spring's coming off. The body's going to be disassembled. You're going to have to dump the fluid to properly fill and bleed the shock. That needs to be completely disassembled. The spring's got to be out to bleed the shock. You know, this one won't be bad with this uh, remote reservoir the way it is. You can use the reservoir basically to bleed the shock, especially if you do what I'm planning on doing where I'm going to disable this bladder. I'm probably going to cut it off right about here. I can't remove it completely because it seals the lower half of the reservoir. So in the, uh, you know, in lieu of an, finding an O-ring that's suitable, what I'll do is I'll simply just trim off the bladder and I'll disable the bladder on this end of it. And I'll put a bladder just like this on a cap that has a Schrader valve on it. This one's going to be, you know, uh, unuseful at that point. KYB actually does sell a 40 millimeter reservoir cap with a Schrader valve built into it. And it's also got, you know, it's got provisions that's machined to accept the bladder on the cap. So the bladder is going to be relocated from this side of the shock to the end of the bladder, which is, or the end of the reservoir, which is a little more, you know, kind of typical. That's, you know, again, that's just like those. That uh, KX there, the bladder goes in the bottom, you know, like that. So basically, it's all oil on the top. And uh, the bladder goes in, you know, that uh, this end here goes in from the bottom, and then the cap is on the bottom. So yeah, anyway, I'm going to retrofit this to a, uh, you know, flip that bladder around. It really doesn't matter which orientation it's in, as long as it's, uh, as long as it's in there and it's not leaking and it holds pressure. Yeah, once that's done, I'll be able to easily bleed the shock, fill it. I usually use ATF. Don't tell anybody. You know, again, uh, oh, you got to use this and that. You don't need nitrogen. You don't need suspension oils. Uh, my theory with a lot of the suspension fluids like fork oil and shock oil on these bikes, they seem to go really far out of their way to get a, what they consider to be an ideal viscosity index, which is like a super wide viscosity index refers to a fluid that is uh, relatively stable over a wide range of temperatures in terms of viscosity. Uh, motor oil, uh, not great. It's really thick when it's cold and really thin when it's hot. These suspension fluids, I think that's primarily probably what they're shooting for is thermal stability. They don't thin out you get more consistent damping. All that being said, uh, I run regular ass ATF in these KXs and uh, forks and shock, believe it or not. Uh, it works great. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, the shock warms up pretty quick when you're riding it. On the street bike, I doubt I'll ever get this thing significantly above ambient temps. You'd have to really put a lot of energy into that shock to get it warmed up. Uh, as a side note, the fluid that came out was fairly high viscosity. It was kind of thick. It was clear liquid didn't have any particular odor, like I uh, didn't notice anything like uh, extreme pressure additive. Some of these things, uh, like uh, gear oil, it's got that stink to it. Uh, the shock oil that comes in this thing, I didn't really smell any kind of, uh, you know, EP additives. Not like, uh, you know, shock oils, especially like you get the KYB or uh, whatever fancy shock oils. They, they do have a certain odor to them. So extreme pressure additives are nice, but uh, whatever Honda puts in these things from the factory doesn't have that EP smell, that high sulfur type of smell. So I think ATF will be fine. Again, I use it in the heavy duty stuff. These bikes see a big air and, you know, really rough terrain ridden uh, aggressively, you know, hard and fast. And uh, ATF holds up great. It comes out looking, you know, again, it's compared to the shock oils that you get. It comes out looking, you know, red and clean after, you know, 60 or 70 hours of getting its ass kicked in those bikes. So I wouldn't hesitate to put ATF in this thing. That should be fine. It may alter the damping a little bit, but hey, who cares? You know, a little lighter damping on these bikes, especially these early ones like that O2 shock there. Uh, they're, yeah, I'd say it's a little firm. I, w I will agree with the uh, people say they're, you know, they're pretty stiff. Uh, it doesn't feel bad. I'm not complaining. It's a sport bike, or at least a sport touring bike. So it is what it is. ATF might soften that up a little bit. You might get lighter compression, lighter rebound. It's all within the range of what I consider acceptable. But uh, yeah, maybe I'll make another video when I do that. Again, the spring's got to come off. The cap has got to come off. The uh, Again, the seal head, if there's a seal head in there, which I'm pretty sure there is, you have to compress that in, which you can do once the bladder and once the pressure has been relieved. Uh, I guess I should say, let's make a point of that. You can't really do anything 
until the pressure has been released from the reservoir. Uh, on a conventional bike, you just press that Schrader valve and blow off the pressure. This thing here, well, for starters, there wasn't a whole lot in it to begin with, so I was able to just push this in freely by hand. Once that, you know, once I've determined there's that little pressure, I was fairly comfortable with the other one uh, drilling straight into this. And uh, yeah, I got a little pss, but damn sure it didn't blow up in my face or anything. So, uh, but that's the first step. Once you relieve the pressure, then you can push these things in. Uh, you know, the reservoir, you push in the top cap, you relieve it, you remove these little circlips, and then you can pull the thing back out. And that's going to be the same operation in here. Relieve the pressure, already done. Uh, pry that cap out. I don't know if it's going to be a thread out or a pry out. I'll fuck with it a little bit and I'll see what works. But once you get that cap out, uh, yeah, snap ring, depress the seal head into the shock, remove the snap ring, the seal head's going to come out. Sometimes they get a little jammed up, that snap ring groove. The O-ring, I'm sure, just like these, again, these KYBs or Showas, they're all the same. The O-ring on the whatever component, whether it's a seal head or whether it's the reservoir cap, that O-ring likes to get snagged in this little groove right there. The O-ring will drop into that groove and it'll be kind of a, sometimes it's a bit of a bitch to try and fight that and get that thing to pop loose. But again, one way or another, once the pressure's out, cap comes off, depress the seal head, circlip comes out, all the guts come out. That'll expose your valving, your seal head, all the, uh, you know, all the internals of this thing. So then once you do that, then you can dump the fluid, you can clean up, you know, it's probably going to be pretty clean, you know, uh, you know, this is no source of debris other than a little bit of wear. There's usually a piston band on the piston that uh, I'm sure is fine. You know, again, these things, I run them hard, and they got a ton of hours on them. And those piston bands, uh, you know, they, so yeah, on the street, you're never going to wear that shit out. But if you want to clean stuff up, you can clean the, uh, the, the once you get the, the seal head off of this damper rod, uh, there's a bolt on the top of the damper rod that holds the piston onto the shaft, and then underneath that, the seal head kind of floats on the chrome part down there. If you grind the peen off of the nut, you can take the nut off at the end of the shaft, you can take the piston and the valving off, you can take the seal head off, you can clean everything up. These use a little bit of dirt, and you know, everything that sticks to that shaft goes up into the seal head, the seal catches it, and look, it'll accumulate a little bit of that stuff in there. But that's a full rebuild, and I'm not there yet. You know, the bike's working good. Uh, judging by the color of the fluid that came out of this thing, I'm sure the one on the bike that has even less miles is even better. So I'm not too worried about doing a full service yet. But uh, considering this one with the bumper being deteriorated, if that's all you need, you have to strip this thing down completely to replace that bumper. Uh, of course, this has got to come apart. The uh, piston, the valving stack, the seal head, everything has to come off the shaft before you can slide a new little doohickey rubber baby buggy bumper down on the bottom there so that kind of sucks you know it's such a simple thing it's just a little flimsy rubber you know bottoming cone or whatever but yeah you got to strip it down to absolutely bare bones before you can do anything with that so uh, I'll do another video on that whenever I get around to it but uh, anyway that'll get you operational if you have the same issue I did where the back here Honda 919 feels like uh, feels loose and it feels like it's topping out that's cavitation, you know. Uh, easy fix though, really. All I had to do was just drill that little guy out, drilled it. I hogged it out with a carbide bit so it was centered and just the way I wanted it. Uh, you know, I wanted to get it just right. Install a Schrader valve in there. And then, once you got a Schrader valve in, then you can pressurize this properly like it was originally. You know, designed to work from the factory. I just used that little half ass bike pump and somehow I got 100 PSI in there. I'm not sure how. Uh, Ideally, though, you know, you want to use something with a, a no-loss truck, which is what uh, these little mountain bike shock pups come with. That little guy there, as you unscrew it, you'll hear a little release of air, but that's only the amount of air that's trapped in this hose and in the mechanism of the gauge. So, uh, yeah, that's what you want to do. It worked great. You got this bike going again for a hell of a lot cheaper than an aftermarket. Oh, you know, a $1,000 shock. I'm sure those old ones really are great, but uh, if you're like me and you don't like to just throw shit away, this is working, so yeah. If you got a 919 that's not riding right, I'd say start with that. If you, you know if it still sucks, then hey, you know, do whatever you want. But this might just get the job done for most of you guys out there. So hope that helps.